Hey guys, Spirit of the Lie here. In the previous video, I covered the first four missions of the Joan of Arc campaign from Age of Kings. So far, we've seen the story of Joan's miraculous transformation from an illiterate peasant into a national celebrity. But Joan wasn't content to simply take back France and the Loire Valley. She wanted to continue pushing now that the English were on the back foot. Charles VII, though, had a different take on things. He was strapped for cash and wanted to consolidate his territory. So he sued for peace with the Burgundians, who for their part were more than happy to use the time to stall and reinforce Paris. Strategically, Rance was in an exposed position, and Charles was impatient to return to the safety of his core territory. Unfortunately, the English had blocked the path back, and with Joan passionately arguing they should continue on to Paris, for the moment Charles reluctantly agreed, but from the start didn't seem to have his heart really in it. This takes us to Mission 5, the Siege of Paris. You'll recognize from the last part that we again see it suggested the evil advisors are manipulating the king. This time though, there might be a bit of truth to it, as the Grand Chamberlain heavily advocated for the truce that Burgundy used to entrench their position. Also, no doubt on Charles' mind, was that Joan had inspired thousands to enlist in the army, and there wasn't enough money to afford all of these soldiers, certainly not enough for a long siege. On top of that, Joan was wildly popular, and even though her actions were always in support of the king, if push came to shove, a sizable number of them would likely have been more loyal to Joan than to the king himself. Though the campaign, I think, oversells this as a major factor at play. First of all, before looking at the scenario itself, let's check in on the map. Yep, somehow it's gotten worse. I'm not sure how the Siege of Paris is supposedly happening hundreds of miles away from Paris. Now despite being ravaged by the Black Death fairly recently, Paris was still one of the largest cities in Europe at the time. It had stronger defenses than anything Joan had faced so far, which is reflected in the scenario. Luckily, you have artillery and a few new heroes to help you out. First, there's Jean de Lorraine, who, unlike all of the heroes so far, is questionable in his existence. The most famous Jean de Lorraine was a French cardinal born almost 70 years after the Siege of Paris, so it's probably not him. More likely, it's reference to a Jean Le Lorraine who is mentioned in a fictional work by Mark Twain as a skilled cannoneer. You also have Lord de Graville, the master of crossbowmen, who fought with Joan at most of her major battles, including Paris. Jean de Alençon and Lahir were both present in real life, but are not included in the campaign. In the campaign, you lead an attack on the gates of Paris and fight your way through the city. A major plot point is that you're holding out for reinforcements to arrive in the heart of Paris while also rescuing some refugees. The six refugees might be a reference to a separate attempt the next year by Charles to take the city, in which a plot was discovered by the English and resulted in the hanging of six Parisians. Whatever the case, this turns into a somewhat comical betrayal of two units being dropped off as the king's reinforcements. A liberty is taken in the story here and brings up the question of why, if this drop-off is possible, the whole army isn't brought in by transport ship as opposed to breaking through the front gate. Unlike in the scenario, Joan and the French army never actually entered the city. Instead, the French attacked the south gates and Joan was shot in the leg with a crossbow bolt, calling for the army to continue the assault. She was carried to safety and, unlike at Orléans, was unable to rejoin the battle. By some reports, the first day had gone well, and at several points, it looked like the French may take the gatehouse. Remember, Charles wasn't particularly excited about the idea of the siege to begin with, though, and he may have lost more faith in the attack after seeing Joan's magical sword break several days earlier, and even more after seeing Joan's most significant injury yet. Considering Joan's recent streak of easy routes, it's easy to see how this all could have been taken as a sign that God was no longer ensuring their victory. Joan's reputation for easy victories may also have hurt her in this case, as the soldiers and their king expected quick results. There's also speculation Charles may have counted on the citizens of Paris rising up to help him overthrow the garrison, but instead the citizens seemed content with their situation, and some even helped defend the city. While all this is going on though, it's easy to see how to Joan, Charles calling off the attack so quickly would have been interpreted as a betrayal. After retreating to safety, Charles then had a large portion of the French army disbanded due to a lack of funds, and continued to press for peace talks. Needless to say, Joan was furious about all of this. One feature I do like in the campaign mission is that there's no way to heal. Besides just increasing the difficulty, that might also be a nod to the fact that the assault on Paris happened over just a few hours. 
Contrast that with the earlier Siege of Orléans, for example, in which fighting occurred over multiple days in different locations, with some rest in between. The narrator then seems to imply that it was immediately after Paris that Joan was captured. But this was in early September 1429, and Joan wasn't captured until May 23rd, 1430, over nine months later. Her actual capture happened at the Siege of Compiègne, just north of Paris, which had declared allegiance to Charles VII, but was under siege by the Burgundians. Joan went with an army, and it was here, while attempting to raid a Burgundian camp, that she was trapped outside the city walls, some say purposefully, and pulled from her horse by a Burgundian archer. Joan was imprisoned by the Burgundians while they tried to negotiate a ransom. An obvious question here is why Charles didn't pay whatever it took to get her back. One explanation I've seen is that Joan's personality didn't always align with Charles' natural disposition to carefully consider options, play it safe, and negotiate where possible. As an example, during a temporary truce with England and Burgundy just before her capture, she'd kept herself busy dictating letters to the Hussites, a pre-Protestant Christian movement in Bohemia, saying after she wrapped things up with the English, they were next. One reading is that Charles may have seen her as a liability to the peace that he was still trying to negotiate with England and Burgundy. Whatever the factors ultimately at play, Joan attempted escape several times from her capture, including jumping from a tower into a moat where she was knocked unconscious. She was eventually sold by the Burgundians to the English, and moved to Rouen where she was tried by a church court. The campaign doesn't go into a lot of detail about the trial. It points out that it was politically motivated, with the main goal being not to kill, but to discredit her, and by extension delegitimize the French King Charles, whom she helped coronate. The English king, who had also recently been crowned King of France, might then have a better claim, at least in public perception. The English, of course, paid for the trial, which was overseen by a French bishop, whose personal loyalty was to the English. In the trial, her examiners tried to catch her in contradictions to prove her voices were from demons and not angels, though Joan largely avoided these pitfalls. They originally charged her on 70 counts, including witchcraft, heresy, and, worst of all, cross-dressing. Eventually, after a year in captivity and experiencing illness, interrogation, having her request to be taken to the Pope denied, and being threatened to be turned over to the English for execution, Joan signed a confession she couldn't even read, denying the divinity of her voices. There's a lot of really dark speculation about why exactly she did that, including assault by the English guards, or that according to one later testimony, those were the only clothes they gave her. Being a heretic was only a capital crime in the case of a repeat offense, so this supposed relapse became justification to sentence her to death. She was then burned at the stake, with the executioner later stating he feared damnation, for he had burned a holy woman. The next mission jumps forward over 20 years to Castillon in 1453, though in the scenario the year is left out and it's presented as almost being contemporaneous. Over that time period a lot had changed. The French had allied with the Burgundians, and thanks to a modern professional army, they pushed the English back from all but two small regions of France. By this point, Charles was a well-established and successful king, on the verge of winning the Hundred Years' War. It features our narrator in the flesh, Guy Jocelyn, along with a mission to deliver the French flag to the hill in Castillon. You also meet up with our old friend, Lahir. Whoa, hold up. It turns out Lahir has actually been dead at this point for a decade. Maybe we should just end the video now. No, I think he would have wanted us to carry on and watch the French victory over those English fops. We also meet up with Constable Richemont, who historically met Joan before the Battle of Pate in Mission 3. He's 60 at this point and not present at the Battle of Castillon, though he was a major contributor to France's success reclaiming territory in the north. The scenario is 0 for 3 at this point of characters that should be present, considering the narrator is also a fictional character. Jean Bureau is a good inclusion here though, and was the commander of the French army at the battle. The mission is first to take a Burgundian city, which doesn't make a lot of sense considering they had been allied with the French for the last 15 years and were on the other side of the country. Now, in reality, the battle was comically one-sided thanks to French field artillery, with 4,000 English dead, wounded, or captured, compared to only around 100 French casualties. Shortly afterward, the French took Bordeaux, and even though the war carried on officially, it was the last major battle and is now considered the end point of the Hundred Years' War. 
I think it makes sense to end the campaign this way on a bit of a hopeful note, rather than ending the campaign with Joan's capture and execution. It definitely hits a better tone and gives the story more closure. Joan became a martyr and symbol for France as the concept of a country began to emerge. In 1450, Charles went to the now French-controlled city of Rouen, where Joan was executed. He demanded an investigation into Joan's trial, which led to a posthumous French retrial at Notre Dame Cathedral. Testimonies were taken from 115 witnesses, speaking to her purity and integrity, including many of the heroes that appeared in the campaign. As much as the first trial was a formality to declare her guilty of heresy though, the retrial was intended by the French to legitimize her, and should be interpreted accordingly. Couchon, the bishop who led the trial against Joan, was excommunicated by the Pope for heresy and convicting an innocent woman for political motivations, ending that man's whole career. Actually, by this point Couchon was long dead, and it was just a posthumous F.U. Joan was ultimately declared innocent in 1456, but it wasn't until 1920 and a revival in her popularity that she was ultimately canonized as a saint within the Roman Catholic Church. It brings up an interesting question though of Joan's divinity. From a modern perspective, it seems antiquated to think God was picking sides in the Hundred Years' War, especially considering it was between two Christian nations. There's certainly a great deal of modern skepticism about the divinity of Joan's visions, and there are many internet diagnoses that have been proposed, including epilepsy, schizophrenia, brain lesions, or bovine tuberculosis from drinking unpasteurized milk, which causes seizures and dementia. Still, there are many Catholics today that believe her visions were divine, and that she was able to prophesize many of the events that occurred to her. What can't be argued though is her place in French history and how her timing coincided with a dramatic turnaround in French success during the Hundred Years War. An impressive feat for anyone, never mind a teenage peasant. While she never killed anyone in direct battle, soldiers reported afterward that she had unusual skill in directing artillery and exceptional bravery on the battlefield. But that's all for this one, hopefully it's inspired you to revisit the campaign or at least have a bit more appreciation for the story it was trying to tell. If you're interested in reading more, the story seems to have been based very closely on a Mark Twain novel about Joan of Arc. It's still in print, but you can also find the PDF for free online. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.